you all could be using in further de uh, departmental conversations that you're having. So they're actually really short. Agreement number one is to stay engaged. Agreement number two is experience discomfort, which is really important. I am someone who, if you asked me what my least favorite thing in the world is, it would the answer would be presenting. Here I am right now. So when I am presenting, I am always experiencing discomfort. Uh, speak your truth. It's really, really important for us to learn and grow together. We have to be honest about our experiences and our truth, even if they're different than the large group. And accept, expect and accept non-closure. We have a very limited amount of time today. And even though I get to continue working with you all over the next few months, that's still a really short amount of time. So it's really important to know that today we're not solving anything. <laughs> there isn't a grand problem that we're going to say, okay, by one o'clock, Jaleesa is going to teach us how to solve racism. <laughs> not actually possible. I think 400 years have shown us that <laughs> it's really hard to unpack and find ways to dismantle oppressive systems, but it's also important to hold the space that we have and to do the work that we can do today. So just a couple um, pieces around those agreements. So for staying engaged, here's what that might look like. I know I'm someone who's really fidgety and I can totally check out sometimes. Oh, I heard of my phone banged or whatever. And I realized, oh, I'm just looking over for a minute but it really does have an impact on the level of engagement that you're able to maintain while you're working. And that experiencing discomfort thing. And I think one of the most important pieces here is it's how we build the muscle for increasing our tolerance. When we purposely engage with things that we know are going to be hard, that's how we learn how to do hard things. Avoiding them, unfortunately, doesn't support us in those ways. So it's important, even when things feel really hard and uncomfortable, to still hang on and engage with them. Again, speaking your truth and making sure what you're sharing is your perspective. And it's okay if for some reason it did, people in the group disagree. We are all very different people and we're gonna have different lived experiences and that's okay. And as I said, there's technically no solution. There's not, I'm not going to teach you any one thing today that's a grand fix to everything else. But in accepting that non-closure piece, you're committing to an ongoing dialogue. So throughout the course of the time that I have with you all over the next few months and the time that you all have with each other through your work, this will be an ongoing discussion and dialogue. All right, so who are you? If you were asked to introduce yourself by answering this question, how would you do so? What might you say? So you can go ahead and start writing that down on your piece of paper. And if you're someone like me who does not enjoy writing huge amounts of sentences, that's okay. You can just start jotting down pieces, just single words that you would use to describe who you are. I'm someone who loves word webs. So whenever I see a question like this, I put myself in the center and I start building out who I am. And as you're doing this, notice the things that you're including in your intro. What are the things that you're noticing that are coming up? What are the things that immediately came to your mind when you saw that question, who are you? What are the things that you felt like, if I am introducing myself to someone, it is 100% essential that they know this about me. Like in my introduction that Beth read, it's really important for me, for other people to know my perspective as a first generation black woman, because it really does guide the interactions that I have with others. That's the lens that I lead with. So for people to engage with me or for me to engage with others, it's really important for them to know that piece about me. And I'm wondering if we have one or two volunteers willing to just quickly share their intros.
you can feel free to just unmute and go ahead and share. I'll do it. <laughs> um, Thank you. The first thing for me was mother. That's probably the most important thing in my life, meaningful. Uh, wife was up there, physician was up there, family physician in particular was in there. And then next for me was um, dog mom. <laughs> I have I like that. A, a million animals that had to be in there. And then educator was in there, author, something I'm proud of. Daughter was way down the list, but it was in there. But those are the things that came to my mind. I love that. It's, and it's interesting that mother came first to you because I was talking to my own mother about presenting today and I was running this past her and she said, well, the first way I would identify is your mom. Like, yep, <laughs> that is clearly a really big part of your identity. And as I said, part of my identity is talking about being a first generation uh, person. My parents' experiences are really tied to who I am as a person. Anybody else, maybe just one more person Thank you for being so brave to share. All right, if we have no one else who feels comfortable sharing, which is totally fine, we'll go on to the next slide. Or I'm gonna ask you to do something similar, but I want you to note the differences. So now, the previous question asked you, who are you? Now, how do you identify? If someone asked you that open-ended question, what would be the pieces of your identity that you would include in how you identify? And you may be thinking, but those are the same question. And I'm hoping that by the end of our presentation, no one will be thinking that those two things are exactly the same. It's important to note that identity is really complicated and you can include anything that feels important or pertinent to you. Like if I were sharing pieces of my identity, if I were sharing who I was, you all got to hear my bio, but if I was sharing my identity, part of my identity would be makeup enthusiast. I am someone whose makeup always matches what I'm wearing. But I am working remotely right now and I had a student the other day say, Miss Anselm, I really need you back so I can see what lipstick you wear every day. <laughs> but that's not something that I would have included in who I am, but it's definitely something that I identify with. My makeup is a huge part of my identity. It's how I show up in spaces particularly because it's often very colorful and loud. And it has forced me to really engage in spaces when I don't want to because it's very hard to show up in any sort of setting with bright blue lipstick and not have someone ask me about it. So now I want you to know if there are any aspects of your identity that overlap with how you answer the question, who are you? because there likely will be overlaps, but as I just demonstrated, there may be pieces that are distinctly different. And if you're still going through that, it's totally fine. I just wanna make sure that I honor my promise of having us end at one o'clock. So we just talked about how describing who you are and thinking about your identity are really related. So now I want us to think about well, what is identity? What does that really mean? So if we look at the um, textbook definition, identity is defined as the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. And that's, in my opinion, probably the most basic definition that you could get of something that doesn't really tell you enough. And that's because this definition, in my opinion, oversimplifies identity and all of the components that make up our identities and thus who we are. So I think about our identities as the pieces of us and the who we are as the whole. And I love this graphic because I think it really clearly um, helps people to visualize just what I said. So I think about identity as those individual puzzle pieces the things that make up 
who we are as a person. And this entire puzzle would be the who we are and I, our identity are those individual pieces. And I want you to note that there are pieces here that are different colors. There are pieces here that are different sizes. And if you think about the different ways that you identify, I imagine you might start to think about, hmm, there are pieces of my identity that are core to who I am and that regardless of the situation that I'm in, I would lead with those. And there are some pieces that mm, maybe aren't so important for me to lead with. They're part of who I am. They're part of that overall puzzle, but they're not necessarily in the forefront. So I think this illustration does a really nice job of demonstrating that. So now I want us to start thinking about those puzzle pieces and what really shapes our identities. And there are so many different things that can shape those identities from our family histories to our lived experience to our genetics, which as physicians, you all know all too well. Other things that can frame our identities are the places that we currently or have lived, the communities that we're a part of, the people who we interact with in life. And our identities aren't only who we are. As I mentioned before, they're those individual building blocks that set the framework for how we exist and operate in the world. So our identities really drive who we interact with and how those interactions happen. And it's important to note that our identities can be ever changing and evolving. And the importance of individual pieces can also change. So there may be a part of your identity that a few years ago was not on your radar. It was part of who you were, but wasn't really something that you thought about a lot. And that may have shifted for whatever reason. So to use myself as an example, um, medical experiences has also has always been a part of how I identify. I'm someone who basically lived at Children's Hospital <laughs> for a couple of years for the amount of times that um, I was in the emergency room. But that was never something that I led with as part of my identity. It was a part of my identity. It was a huge part of my adolescence, but it wasn't something that I led with. Two years, nope. Wow, it's 2021 now. So four years ago now, I was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which for me explains all of the frequent visits to the emergency room with my frequent subluxations and dislocations. And as someone who has now had um, two hip repairs and deals with a daily hip pain and those dislocations, my identity as a disabled person is absolutely something that I lead with. And it's what it has become one of the most important pieces of my identity. And four years ago, while medical issues were definitely a part or a piece of me, they weren't something that I often talked about. Now you'll find it very hard for me to be in an extended conversation with someone where that doesn't come up. And some pieces of our identities can be even more subconscious, and but they can still shape who we are without us even knowing. So if you think back to the puzzle that I showed you before, and you think about a physical puzzle and the wooden backing on each of each piece of a puzzle, if you're missing that backing, it's going to be really hard to adequately and appropriately fit your puzzle piece in, right? It's not going to sit just right. So those subconscious identities are definitely part of who we are, and they do add to and help frame our identities, but they might be things that we don't even think about. I know when I'm putting together a puzzle, I don't really think about that wooden backing. I just think, well, it's the way the puzzle is, right? And that might be the way in which we interact with people. I don't really know why they behave this way. I don't really know what their story is, but this is who they are, and I've accepted that. So I want us to start thinking about some of the common ways that people identify or the common identifiers that come up when you ask someone a question like, who are you or how do you identify? What are the things that you identify with? So the first one is race, thinking about the racial group or groups that you belong to. The next one, really related but slightly different, thinking about your ethnicity and your cultural traditions and identities, your gender identity, 
which is not necessarily a biological sex, your sexual or romantic orientations, thinking about the people who you choose to love, religion, and I always think it's really important to, in this piece, where we talk about what we believe, to also note that for some people, their religion is not to believe. There isn't a higher being or power that they believe in. And that's part of their identity. And it's important to note that. Your socioeconomic slash your class status, your ability status. And I think it's important to note that ability status exists both in the mental and physical realm. So thinking about neurodiversity and learning differences and also thinking about physical differences. And then your chronological age. Those, these are some of the most common ways in which people identify and talk about who they are as people and what shapes them. But as we've talked about, there are also some things below that. There are things that we don't always lead with. So one of those things that I think about is your birth date. You all might be sitting here and go, well, why is that such a big part of some people's identity? Or why is that something that we touch on or note on? Think about the stock that so many people uh, place in astrology and thinking about their astrological signs. For some people that really guides who they are and how they interact with folks. I know for myself as someone is, who describes themselves as highly emotional and cries at the drop of a hat, I am a cancer. <laughs> and that is something, so for me, that is a part of my identity that I often talk about. Thinking about places that you've traveled to totally opens up your lens on how you're able to see the world based on living in or traveling to visiting other places. Your marital status. For some people, that's a huge part of who they are. For others, it's really not. You might also be looking at this and go, hmm, why would your criminal record be relevant to, to your identity? If you're someone who has that and you are applying for jobs, that's going to be a huge piece of your identity and the story that you have to tell about yourself. So I say all this to say, and I love this microscope because we can look at people and think, here's how this person presents. Here are the things that I think that I know about them. Although there has been tons of stuff in research, looking at gender specifically to say, actually, we can't necessarily tell someone's gender just by looking at them. And there are lots of other identities that are like that as well. By Just by looking at someone, we don't necessarily know what makes them who they are. And this can be true for ourselves as well. We might not even realize the things that are underlying that shape how we interact with others. So in thinking about all of this, it's really important to specifically focus on identity conscious practice. So understanding that identity, self, interact, and interactions are informed birth, both by the internal process as well as those external influences. So Dr. Liza Toulousen is a mentor of mine and someone who leads identity conscious practice work all over the country. And I remember when I took my first workshop with her and we were unpacking an identity and talking about identity, it was really the first time that I sat and thought about all of the pieces that make up who I am as a person. I don't know that there was ever a time where I thought about those pieces that I didn't necessarily immediately identify when someone asked me who I was or how I identified. And to engage in identity conscious practice means to bring an awareness of yourself into the interactions with others and to acknowledge that those interactions are also informed by other people's sense of self. And I find that last line to be incredibly important. So the interactions that you have around your own identity with others can also be shaped by their identities and the way the energy that they're giving off or the, in, the way that they interact with people. So if you are someone who like me is conflict averse and does not like getting into heated debates and conflicts, if you're dealing with someone who identifies as a combative person that's really going to shape the interactions that you have. You're going to have to make a decision on 
am I going to engage? Am I not going to engage? And what are the pieces of my identity that allow me to make those decisions or inform how I make those decisions? And in order to really begin to think about how to unpack all of this, we really do have to actively be thinking about what it is that informs all of the decisions that we make and deliberately name them, deliberately name which pieces of our identities we lead with. So one of the pieces of my identity that I lead with is that I'm an educator. So no matter what I'm doing or whom I'm talking to, I'm educating. It's really hard to take off that teacher hat, even though I'm a full-time administrator now and no longer a classroom teacher, I find myself pretty much in every conversation that I'm having, that I'm framing it from the lens of trying to teach something. And my goal in teaching isn't necessarily to change someone's mind or their perspective, but it's to help them frame, it's to help me help them frame a different lens of looking at something, a different way of looking at something and expanding the ways that they look at things. So Lisa, can I ask yeah, you a question? Of course, let me go back. Um, you mentioned the combative person. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I mean, do maybe people do self-identify as being combative, combative, but my sense is that I would be the one identifying them as being combative, right? They might view themselves as being advocates for something. And I'm wondering how you, because we're making, as we have our own identity consciousness about ourselves, I yeah. think we also are making a lot of assumptions or reading people's behavior and deciding what their identity is. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Absolutely. Such a good question. So two things. I think that it's totally possible that as you're interacting with someone that you might do exactly what you just said, Beth, you might be making a judgment like, hmm, okay, this person feels like the energy that I'm receiving from this person feels really combative. And that's a judgment that I'm making. And it may not be the way that they view themselves. They may be, view themselves as someone who's passionate, someone who's really an active advocate. That's definitely true. And I think in that way, oftentimes what I say to people is, okay, so what I'm hearing is and letting them know what it is that I'm hearing from their response, because that gives them the opportunity to stop and clarify. So if they are behaving in a certain way or saying a certain thing that to me feels really off, I often do say, so here's what I'm hearing. And here's how what you just said landed on me. So that way too, it gives them the opportunity to be able to name, yeah, that is how I wanted that to land or, oh, that's actually not how I wanted that to land on you. Let me clarify. I will say I do have some people in my life who do identify as combative people and will tell you that pretty much any interaction that you have with them is going to be combative. I actually have a uh, phone call with a colleague tomorrow um, around an email that he sent that was, in my opinion, really uh, microaggressive. And his response to me and asking to talk to him was, yeah, I pretty much knew when I sent you that email that you were going to email me back, but you know that I have to be combative and go back and forth with you. So he and I will do, be doing some hacking tomorrow about how inappropriate it is to purposely send an email that you know is going to trigger someone. There's a different, in my opinion, there's a different way to get a message across. So again, thinking of myself as an educator, there will be some teaching that happens on that call tomorrow. Does that answer your question, Beth? Yeah. And it, I mean, it takes oddly some insight to identify yourself as like, oh yeah, I'm someone who is combative. On the other hand, it seems like an opportunity to do that education. So that is helpful. Thank you. No problem. So if you can get a clean piece of paper and draw this little gingerbready figure, doesn't have to be perfect. If I thought about the ways in which I identified, um, artist or someone who draws well would not be anywhere in my identity <laughs> conscious practice, which for me is hysterical because my sister is an artist, has a BFA, and my brother is a dancer and a poet and a writer. So somehow the art gene skipped me. <laughs> so if yours ends up looking really weird and wonky in your opinion, 
I promise you that mine will likely look worse. And as you're drawing your little figure, here's what I want you to add to it. I want you to add a circle in the middle that's sort of right in the core center of your little person. Then outside of that, I want you to draw a bigger circle that encompasses basically your whole figure. And now I want you to draw a third circle that is basically outside of the entire figure. There's a little teeny overlap there, but it's mostly outside of that circle. And now we're gonna start talking about the zones of proximity. So part of the work of identity conscious practice is really being able to identify where your different where your different identifiers land. To be able to think about the way that you lead, it's important to think about which pieces of my identity are the ones that no matter what I am doing, they are going to they are going to either lead or impact my interaction or the way that I'm thinking and feeling. And that's that little circle right here in the middle. What are the things that no matter what the circumstance is, no matter where you are or what you're doing, those pieces for you are always going to frame your interactions. That's what's gonna go in this yellow here. And in a moment, I'll show you another slide where I will show you where these should go, where the uh, different identifiers should go. This orange circle out here, which is a lot larger, is really thinking about those pieces of your identity that are important to you. They inform your opinions. They inform the way that you think and believe and behave. But they're the pieces of your identity that you're not necessarily always thinking about. So for myself, my gender identity, I identify as female. It's an important piece of who I am, but it's not always something that I'm talking about. Like if I'm in a situation where gender comes up or something like that, then yeah, of course I'm talking about my gender identity, but it's not necessarily something that I feel like I have to lead with. It doesn't impact every single interaction that I have. And then that purple zone, which is basically on the outside of your person, are those things that you really do not have as, do not think of as part of your identity the things that are so far out there for you that it would be really hard to interact with someone who is leading from that place. So for example, let's say I put out here ability status. If that was something for me that was not something I was really close to, something I was proximate to, it might be hard for me to identify with someone who really leads from that, leads from that perspective. It's actually a conversation that I have with lots of my friends who for them ability status is in that purple zone. And for me, it's right in my yellow. It guides every interaction I have with people. I have friends that go, you make everything about ableism. I said, well, in my life, most things are about ableism and you have a different lived experience and that's okay. But it's important for me, for you to know that about me. So as we think about those zones of proximity, you're thinking about how close you are to these different identifiers. The things that you are feeling really close to and are really at your core are gonna be in the yellow space. The things that are, important to you, that are important to you but don't necessarily guide every interaction, those will go in the orange. And then the things that are so far out there for you that it would take that extra step, some extra work would have to happen on your part to really be able to feel close or proximate to that experience or to that identifier. So as I generate this list, here's what I want you all to be thinking about. If you had to take each of these identifiers and place them on your little person, 
where would they go? Which things would you be very proximate to? Which identities would you feel very, very close to and feel like those are right in the center for you? Which identities would go in that orange space? That space where it's something that you feel close to, it's something that's important to you, but it doesn't necessarily guide every interaction. And then which things are in that purple zone outside of your zone of proximity, the things that you don't feel close to and that extra work or extra step would have to happen for you to be able to identify or feel close or proximate to those identities. And because I believe very strongly in role modeling, I will show you all my zone of proximity in a minute. But I want to give people some time. Because for some of these, it might be hard to think about where to place them. I should also say that it's okay if you feel like something's on the periphery. You feel proximate to it, but not entirely. Like there might be things that you feel, I have some knowledge here. There, I could have conversations about this. So that might not go in your purple, but it could be on that purple orange line. There might be pieces that are really important to you, but sometimes you turn that piece off. That might be on a yellow orange line. So they don't have to fit neatly inside of each of those circles. Identity work is messy and it's ever changing and ever flowing. Just like I do about gender, I like to think about identity on a spectrum and that those pieces can shift and change over time. So I see some people still working, which is fine. So I'll give you another couple minutes. I will say the first time I did this, it probably took me half an hour. If anyone has a question while they're doing this, feel free to pause and ask. I have a question about when you say you lead with it, does that mean you're able, willing to present yourself that way or talk about it? Such a good question. So what I mean when I say lead with, I mean that is the perspective that you see the world from that identifier is really guiding the interaction that you're having. It is framing the lens that you look at the world with. Doesn't mean that you are openly willing to talk about and engage. So for me, for example, thinking about my ability status, it is something that I talk a lot about, but there are days where I really don't want to. And the days where I really don't want to are usually because they're heavy pain days. So that heavy pain is really guiding the interaction that I'm having with folks, especially because those are the days where I feel like my temper is really short, but not something that I necessarily want to talk about. Great question. Now that helps me. I, I would, I'm a product of childhood abuse. So that tremendously shapes how I present myself to the world, but I never talk about it. So that's a perfect example. I think about that with, for me, mental health status. I am someone who deals with depression and anxiety and a whole host of other mental health things. And I don't think outside of my sister that I ever talked about the suicidal ideations that I had in high school with anyone else. If three therapists and I still hardly ever talk about it. They're aware because it's in my medical records, but we hardly talk about it. But it definitely frames the interactions that I have with people and it really frames how I interact with students. Because in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking about, but what is underlying for that student? What's going on here that I'm not aware of? 
and it helped it has helped me build my capacity for my students especially for students who feel like they are a behavioral concern or there are other things coming up that make them appear to be problematic So just so that I keep us on time and that there's a couple minutes for if you all have more questions, I'll show you my zones of proximity. So the things that absolutely always guide the interactions that I'm having with folks are my race, my ethnicity, nationality. So even though I was born in the United States, neither of my parents were, my two older siblings were not. So even though I was raised in the United States, my household definitely didn't feel like a typical American household. There are still words that I don't know the English version of. So for me, always guides the interactions that I'm having with folks. Like I just said, my mental health status, my ability status, and my health experiences, even if I'm not always talking about them, they're always shaping the way that I interact with folks every single time to the point that sometimes I have to check myself and remind myself that others might not be viewing the world in that way. Now for my orange, like I shared before, my gender identity is an important piece of my identity, but it's not necessarily always the lens that I'm looking through. My social economic status, my body size, always something that I'm thinking about, especially as someone with hip issues, I'm always constantly thinking about my weight and trying to make sure that I'm not putting additional weight on my hips as, um, as physicians, I'm sure or you can all appreciate that. So I'm, it's something that I'm often thinking about, but it's not necessarily the lens that I'm always leading with. Same thing with my work experiences and my occupation. Being an educator is a huge part of who I am but there are times where, even though it's hard, I force myself to take that educator hat off, especially when I'm in a space of learning and I need to put the student hat on. I've been doing a lot of work with my students around um, gender inclusivity and ungendering language. And I remember a couple of weeks ago, I said to a group of my students, I said, guys, let's get started. And one of my students stopped me and said, Miss Anselm, you told us that we're not supposed to address an entire group of people with a gendered pronoun, if we or with gendered language, if we don't know that everyone identifies that way. And I was like, okay, take off the teacher hat, put on the student hat. You're right. Thank you for calling me out. <laughs> so it's, like I said, it's important. And I almost always have that teacher hat on, but it's important to remember that I need to be looking from the learning perspective as well. And then I look about, I look at and think about the stuff that's outside for me. My height is not something that I think about ever. I'm taller than what the average height is for women. I know that there are some people that I know who are either a lot taller or a lot shorter than I am. And that's something that they talk about a lot. And I always have trouble identifying with that because for me, my height is perfect for who I am. But I have a friend who is really, really short. And pretty much every interaction that I have with her, something around her height comes up. Religion is one of the things that's on that periphery for me. I identify as a really spiritual person. I think that I have a great relationship with God, but I don't necessarily identify as any one religion. Political beliefs fall in there for me too. And then you'll notice that out here, family structure is so far moved over here. I have two heterosexual parents who have been married for 40 years. I almost never think about my family structure because it's so typical. When people talk to me about divorce or having same-sex parents, those are all things that I empathize with but it's not a place that I can lead from because it's not something that I have real deep personal connection to. Geographic location is the same thing. I love living in Boston, but I don't ever necessarily think about how living here has shaped and framed the way that I see the rest of the world. For other people, that may not be true. Wherever they've grown up or wherever they live right now, might really guide how they see the world. Particularly if you're looking at someone who is in a really affluent community, 
that might shape the way that they interact with others who aren't. Or if you flip that, people who aren't in really affluent communities who have a hard time identifying with wealth and affluence. So just some things for us to be thinking about. And I'm looking at our time. We only have about six minutes left, which is perfect because we're about to wrap up. So I want you to think about what was that process like for you? I would love if one or two people could share what that was like, and it's okay if you were in a space where it doesn't feel comfortable to do that yet, it's totally fine. It's why for myself, I offer up so many examples so that people don't feel like they have to <laughs> offer up examples to be able to get the material. But if someone feels comfortable or brave enough to sh just share the process, not even necessarily saying where you put your identifiers, but just what that doing that felt like would be really helpful. I'll speak up. <laughs> um, for me, it was a fascinating process because I was thinking, like, I'm a relational person. So I look how, at how others see me or who I, who I advocate for. And it's a question of, you know, does that, does that advocacy or who I try to advocate, does that go in core or is that that I really can't relate to them because my life is so different, um, but I can relate to them because I'm trying to advocate all the time. So it, it was kind of, it, it, it challenged my framework enough that I feel like I really need to stop and think about what goes in that yellow, what goes in the orange and what goes in the purple. And we'll take a little more time than I had here to do that. Things that I initially put in there, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa maybe, maybe that's not supposed to go that in that Mine place. changes so, every time I do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, that was mine. Thank you. So if anyone else is willing to share what the process felt like, I would love that but just in case no one else is feeling brave enough or comfortable enough to do that, it's totally fine. But some things that I do want you to silently reflect on are have you ever done something like this before? And Deb just sort of answered this question of, was it difficult to identify your proximity to certain identifiers? I know for me, every time I do it, it is. Especially that was a long list, but when I have worked with people for longer periods of time, they get an even longer list. And I really believe in practicing what I preach. So anytime I present, I make myself do the work that I ask participants to do. And every time I add identifiers to that list, it gets harder to do. And if there was more than one identity or identifier that was hard to name your proximity to, were those identifiers connected to each other? Did they relate to one another? And if they did, that might give you a bigger picture or start to build a bigger picture of why it might be difficult to identify your proximity to that identifier. I wanted to say, uh, this is Kitty, I wanted to say that I had, um, I found it very interesting what I don't identify with isn't so much because I, I, don't, I have difficulty with it, but it's because I accept it as a baseline. I accept my accent mm. is pretty much un, undifferentiated. I, it exists, you know, I don't have, I don't come from a particular place with it, except the United States. I'm white, I'm female, all those things I identify as she, her, I have, you know, I have sort of a lot of things that are just like, I feel like, oh, these are baselines. I don't identify with them. What surprises me is that we oftentimes, um, those are the things that are called up that we identify as as away from baseline, as, a, as opposed to baseline. And I think that's interesting in and of itself is that, you know, certain things that we have no control over the, you know, that we, <laughs> that we don't, have, that we think is different than baseline. So I think there's so much that I sort of took in. And I think, again, as providers, I think the thing that we do that's sort of unique to us is we use everything that we have to identify. And so when we are trying to make, you know, in a 15 minute appointment or trying to make this, a relationship happen, we just leave the things that we think are not gonna be useful and adopt the things that we think are going to be useful and probably have an 80% hit rate. 
you know, in terms of, but I, it is interesting to me how many things I don't have, I don't think about. I don't, it's not whether I have to think about them or I don't, I just don't think about it in terms of myself. I feel like that that's all given. I'm a woman of an age as well. So I'm one of the invisible, you know, over 50 women. And I think that, you know, that's another part, which actually lends itself to being a helper because I don't, you know, as much as I'm um, taking up <laughs> the space and talking or whatever, I, um, there's a lot of space created for, for the other in that relationship. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. It's a really, really interesting perspective. And I'm so glad that you named that. So, um, oh, yeah. we, we are at time. And I just wanted to make one observation is that I feel like this is such a great foundation for talking about bias and privilege. You know, I was thinking as I wrote immigration status around the outside, I was like, oh, lucky me. You know, like, <laughs> I'm really fortunate to not have to think about that all the time. And so it just felt like this is so foundational and identity, you know, is, is truly foundational, but also foundational to this work. Absolutely. Um, so I just really appreciate you setting this, this foundation for us so that we can start to move forward. And I, I look forward to the small group discussions if people wanna join tomorrow. So this last question here really is to lead you into those small group discussions tomorrow, Great. thinking about which zone of proximity might've been hardest to fill in, which one was easiest and start to think about why, because as Beth said, this is how we build the foundation for talking about bias and microaggressions and privilege and power. Well, Thank you so much. You're so welcome. And I just added one more question for you all to be thinking about too. Great. Really thinking about, do those that have those identifiers shifted for you over time? Do they shift for you over time? And finally, thinking back to that initial question that I asked you, now that you've sort of had a taste of exploring those zones of proximity and identity consciousness, would your answer to those two questions at the beginning change, who you are and how do you identify? Thank you all so, so much for this opportunity. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. We do too. Thank you so much. Appreciate you're your time. You're so welcome. Your Feel free to reach out if other things come up for you or there are things that you're continuing to unpack that you have questions about. Terrific. See you next month. Sounds good. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone. Thanks for joining.